This is Naked Pine. Naked Pine. M I P. With Masamela Mafumo. Mark Thompson. Naked Pine. Get woke. It's Thursday once again, folks. You know what that means. Time for another edition of our one of our favorite and your by the numbers in terms of downloads. Thursday Coast, one of our favorite segments, uh, which highlights not only the founder of the largest online progressive community, Daily Coast, DailyCoast.com, the founder of Civics with a Q with one of the largest uh, samples in terms of polling Americans. Uh, and also the host of his own podcast, The Brief. We welcome him once again, our friend and brother, Marcos Melitzis. Hey, buddy, how are you? Doing great, Mark. Thanks so much. Glad to have you. Let, let's let's be a little a uh, little bit wonky, just just to start out. Um, inflation, the Fed. What is the conversation, from your point of view, within our largest progressive? community how how much uh do you think inflation is an issue for progressives and and those of us on the left i mean it's gonna be it's gonna be an electoral issue so it's clearly um it's it's really uh the republican party's best argument heading into november now we can make all the arguments in the world about how it's it's you know COVID you know fueled after the COVID uh, uh, downturn and how every single country in the world is facing inflationary pressures and how the war in Ukraine is exacerbating. Then we can make all those arguments. All Republicans need to do is point to the price of gas, um, you know, under corner gas stations. And like one of my coworkers said it really well. He said that the price of gas is the only economic indicator that regular Americans see in one, you know, two feet letters, two feet numbers everywhere they go. Uh, it's just the reality. And so um, the counter to that, it's going to have to be based on, yeah, there has to be a sort of like an acknowledgement that inflation's real. Uh, I know Biden's now talking tough about a, a um, windfall tax to oil companies because they're, they're having record profits. I mean, <laughs> everybody's taking an opportunity to use inflation as an excuse to gouge uh, consumers. And so there has to be that. And it, they should have done that, you know, you know, six months ago, right? They should have been talking about how the, the oil companies are gouging us and, and making moves to that. And so I, I don't understand. I don't understand Democrats. Um, the, the, as far as I, oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I just want to isolate that statement. That very statement alone is kind of existential for us. We've been doing this for years, I just, but it's real. We don't understand Democrats. So, so what do people might ask? Well, if they don't, we don't. What are we doing? Okay, but good. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That, that don't was just a profound four word statement. Like we don't understand Democrats. All right. And so thanks yeah. for joining today, folks. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> the end period. I, 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 I really, I really don't. I don't understand them on that. I don't understand them on student debt. I don't understand them on a lot of, on a, on a lot of things. Um, I don't understand them on this fetish they have of, you know, trying to sell themselves as the bipartisan party. You know, we're trying to work with Republicans on, on gun control. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. And voters do not reward anybody for reaching across the aisle. It's just not a thing that exists. But um, but aside from that, no, inflation, it's it's it's, you know, the Republicans are going to do their thing with uh, with uh, caravans from Honduras. They're going to they're do all the usual culture war stuff. This is the one inflation is the one thing that they have where they can uh, they can really appeal to people's visceral effect. I mean, you can even make the argument that that salaries that are at an all time high, right? Employment unemployment is is at a record low. You can you can talk about that that your purchasing power is more, but people don't think that way. They don't think I'm making five thousand dollars more, and I have to pay an extra two hundred bucks in gas a month. Like they don't think that way. People are not that sophisticated. They're not doing their annual budget and have a spreadsheet in front of them to realize that they're coming out ahead. And so you just have to acknowledge that there's pain in, in inflation for sure, definitely. And, uh, and then really lean into the existential threats to our freedoms and our democracy and hope that that motivates our base. Because our base is not going to be motivated by inflation. 
right? Our base is going to be motivated by like, are we really losing our, our freedom to make medical decisions with our doctors? Are we really going to be losing our right to vote? Those are the things that we need to use to motivate our base and make sure they understand what's at stake. Uh, we're not going to win an argument on, on inflation just because it's too, it's too hard. And, you know, there's, there's the adage, the old adage in, in politics that if you're explaining, you're losing. Um, no, I, I think you're right. But you're right. The lack of understanding. I think Republicans get it. And I think I know what they're up to, even though they're, most people, a lot of voters aren't old enough to remember. There's some still around. Um, gas prices took out Jimmy Carter. Uh, but it was a different time, a different context. There wasn't a whole lot else going on other than the Iran hostage crisis. So it was a perfect storm. I'm sure they're thinking, well, you know, we can repeat this. Uh, uh, that's what Republicans are thinking. Democrats, on the other hand, you're right. Don't learn from that. And you're right. This is late to say that the oil companies are not helping. That a de facto monopoly, my word, when it comes to the meatpacking industry. So he said that very well. That he was talking to that and said, why come y'all? Didn't, why you tell us about, about that? We have only so many folks. um places where meatpacking is done. Everything has become so uh, monopolized, so to speak. And, and, you know, one or two companies doing everything like like Amazon in another way yeah. that the fewer meatpacking places you have, that's what causes it to go, causes it to go up. Uh, and they don't talk enough about how um, the, the good the, it's a good reason why a bad thing is happening. The recovery from COVID in terms of people getting back out here and going to work was quicker than expected. And so supply has not met the demand of every of all of us coming back, being resurrected, coming out from the tomb like La- Lazarus, as uh, my other yeah, person was like saying. Chinese um, lockdowns because of COVID mean that those supply lines got locked up, which, again, restricts supply, which raises price. I mean, this is we have an interrelated global economic system. Uh, if anything, I think we've exposed the fallacy of the of the really thin um, logistical lines, right? Where businesses were like right on the edge and they were hyper efficient and right. and they didn't have a lot of inventory because inventory costs money to to store and it costs potential money if the demand's not there, right? So they've gotten really good at running these razor thin logistical lines that work great when everything is fine. Suddenly you have a pandemic, you have a war and those those um, those uh, hyper efficient logistical lines interdependent on, you know, repressive regimes in China and elsewhere. Now we see the problem with that. And everybody in the world is facing this. Everybody in the world is facing this. But they'll blame Joe Biden because, you know, Joe Biden magically can overcome. the, And that's a. I mean, that's just not an argument that flies electorally. It just, you know, it used to be flat out. Um, it's a it's an emotional argument and voters punish the party in power. Yeah. In yeah. a normal election year, we'd be we'd be we'd be dead in the water. It'd be over. Right. Um, the Supreme Court's giving us an assist. Donald Trump is giving us an assist. The Republicans, the Q caucus and, you know, giving us candidates like Herschel Walker, they're giving us an assist. So Republicans are doing everything they can to 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 bail out Democrats. But it's a tough climate. And we've said that from the very beginning. And and I will say this, even if inflation wasn't high, Republicans would invent something that would have that same effect. I mean, they don't need reality to to create, you know, Honduran migrants, right? You know, the hordes that are invading our southern border. They would just lean in and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So the January 6th hearings are underway. Uh, and, you know, th- there have been some pretty significant revelations. You had on the brief this week, Brandy Buckman of, of Daily Coast. And she has been, you know, really all in in terms of the coverage have do you think and and i've agreed with you that the few people are going to change your mind particularly on the right yeah but 
do you do you think that it still might something happen? Because this thing about him raising a quarter of a billion dollars off of nothing. I mean, I even think some people who like him say, wait, 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 wait. How much money did I send him? You know, for this to be. <laughs> and, and even if they still believe it was fraud, he didn't do nothing with the money. There's nothing to show for it that he actually invested in anything to do. Anything. Yeah, I, I've seen I've started seeing some grumblings in some pro Trump corners of the Internet. Uh, the, the piece that really resonated in. in uh, so maybe surprisingly so, because, you know, Trump has been able to get away with everything so far is paying Kimberly Guilfoyle. How do you say her last name? Whatever her last name is. That's it. It's Guilfoyle, right. Uh, paying her, what was it, $70,000 for a three minute introduction of her boyfriend at the Trump rally. Mm. Those are the things where people are like, wait a second, you know, you have, you have seniors on fixed incomes being bombarded. I mean, 20 emails a day, that's, that's just next level insanity. And these people are responding and donating money to save their, you know, save Donald Trump. And he's basically using it just to grift his family and friends. Not a dime of it was spent on. I mean, it's like, remember that, you know, BS recount in Arizona, like he didn't pay for that. So the things that supposedly he was going to pay for, he didn't. It's just a grift. And I, I'm starting to see some grumbling on, on right wing uh, sites about that in a place that the only grumbling I had seen against Trump so far had been when he said to vaccinate like that, that, that got people riled up. They seem to be over that now. This maybe may start having some, some impact. Um, Trump released this 12 page response to the committee, which I got through a page and a half and it was, it was like my brain hurt. It was so dumb. And so I, I didn't get, <laughs> I couldn't, I could, I'm not, I couldn't finish. I couldn't even get to page three, but, um, but his argument is that this is a kangaroo court because it's, it's not bipartisan. And, and the funny thing is, is it's, in, it's, he's right. It's not bipartisan. Every witness has been a Republican. Every single witness has been a Republican. And so it's, um, to me, I, I laugh, but you know what else is really funny, Mark, is that the reason this committee exists as it does today is because of Donald Trump. Right. I don't know if you remember, but the original proposal by Democrats was a joint committee, half Republicans, half Democrats. Republicans were going to get to make their own their own picks. So Jim Jordan and all, all the seditionists themselves would have been on the committee and it had a deadline of December 31st of last year. So the Republicans in that committee would have just filibustered until, until the time ran out. There would have been no report. There would have been no nothing as, as comprehensive and as serious as what we're seeing out of this committee today. And the reason that failed, because originally um, Kevin McCarthy was, was all aboard on that. And the reason it failed was because Donald Trump himself went on a, went on a tantrum and scuttled it. And so that gave Democrats the ability to not just create a committee that was actually a serious committee without Jim Jordan in it, but it also opened the door for Liz Cheney to to become co-chair. And I got to say, this committee is what it is today. As much as I hate to give any Cheney credit for anything, it is what it is today because of Liz Cheney, because, you know, Bernie Thompson just you said, oh, we're not going to do any criminal referrals. And she's like, I, <laughs> I don't know about that. And we've seen that time and time again, where the Rep Democrats are doing a Democrat thing. Oh, we're not going to we're not going to subpoena somebody to show up to the committee. And Liz Cheney's the one that's like, um, you got you all got to start acting like Republicans and actually doing stuff. And um, I wish I wish Democrats on the committee were like taking notes and learning from this because she is the reason this committee is actually getting somewhere as opposed to just being you know i don't know just a, an exercise in futility and and irrelevance she's made that committee relevant you know and a lot of people heard you say that on the show last week and were commenting to me it's like wow that's that says something so you're right the electoral setback of inflation it would seem to me people would even want to counter that by doing something um, less milk toast. 
Oh, get our side excited. Get our side excited. Republicans know how to motivate their base. Somebody wrote, oh, I think it was Chris Hayes on Twitter, mm. uh, said that, that Democrats mobilize their base when they're out of power, but when they're in power, they try to demobilize the base. They are afraid of the base. So, oh, we'll talk about, you know, um, student loan forgiveness when we're out of power. As soon as they're in power, they're like, oh, my God, don't talk about anything. Don't push us. Don't don't pressure us. The and reason they're, they're in power is because they promise student debt forgiveness. They promise to fight for our democratic right to vote. They promise to protect women's right to choose. They promise these things. And then yet they're afraid to deliver because, oh, no, we might alienate. No, you're not alienating anybody. You know who's at play. There's one. The election's going to be based on two things. One, can we get our, our core base out? Number one, can we get our core base out? That's the most important thing. Number two is, can we get the only swing voters in America are suburban, college-educated white women? They're very, very, very swingy. Like, you know, we won in large part in 2020 because of college educated suburban white women. We lost in Virginia because we lost some of those voters. And so that's a swing vote. It's a real swing vote. None of the, you know, the issues of choice of college loan forgiveness. These are not issues that demobilize college educated white women. College educated. (laughs) They have loans. Their children have loans. These are issues that really work to gun control. People don't want to worry when they send their kids to school, but you have Democrats voting to provide extra protection to the Supreme Court justices. How about you vote to provide protection to children? These are things that mobilize our base and don't demobilize college-educated suburban white women. This is the freebie. It's It's a no brainer. And yet we have to fight. And then they're like, oh, no, you know, the base that, you know, moderate voters is. There's no moderate voters. There's only college educated suburban white women and our base. That's it. So. So but let, let's 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 go there for a minute. Um, college, suburban, college educated white women. What What's their deal? What what is it about them? They they you would. Say one is they have asshole husband, right? White men, like they've got that in the house, so they got that influence, like you know, in one ear. So you got to deal with that. But if if you would have to if you would have to categorize it in anything, it would probably be socially liberal, fiscally conservative. So they are going to be motivated by the inflation argument, but they're also going to be motivated by you know what you and your daughters. Even your sons, you know, your son knocks up some girl. Do you really want to do you really want to take abortion off the table? These are issues that are that motivate that that, you know, obviously uh, that forgiveness is a big one because college again, it's really it's in the demographics name, college educated them and their children. And so college affordability is a big, big piece. Inflation is, but so is college affordability. Um, so, and then gun control, gun control actually pulls very well amongst most women, actually, even, even rural women. So, um, that's, those are issues that we can definitely run in. And, you know, it, that's the beauty of it. There's, there's the, the one persuadable group is not, we don't lose them on our core issues. Now, if we were running on like defund the police, that, that would, you know, that, does not play well in the suburbs um, for a variety of reasons, including basic racism, but also their experience with police is different than the urban experience with police. Uh, what else? Do, um, we may lose them on. I think that may be it. I don't, I don't think they're particularly motivated by the immigration hysteria from the Republican side. I don't think that resonates with them um, because a lot of them actually have they're the ones that deal with household finances usually. And that means the, the housekeeper, the gardener, the, and so on. Right. So they're, they're not as hostile to immigrants as Fox news watching men. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, 
instead of leaning into the things that motivate our base, which we need them to turn out, uh, because the argument, their, their base argument is going to be, oh, no, the Donald Trump, right? That's going to be the, and it's just, you got to give them more than that. Given that so much is at stake, that's the argument, not, oh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump's not on the ballot. He's kind of on the ballot. And we can use that. But that, that can't be the cornerstone of our argument. Well, look, you say fiscally conservative. I mean, you put it rather um, raw and plain spokenly. Somebody, this is some, some woman's son, some suburban college educated white woman's son knocks somebody's daughter up. That's money. Yeah. And That's, the future. That's her child's future. Yeah, just money. But everybody knows when you're young and you do something like that, that's unplanned and, uh, and accidental, everything yeah. changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is, <laughs> this is, this is, this is going to be deep now. Um, and, and maybe though, if, if it's the fiscal thing though, I mean, I, I have no, I'm talking, we're talking about people who aren't really, that aren't in our universe, but I, I'll be honest with you. When 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 you turn on um, the Seven Hundred Club and 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 those other people, Pat, whatever his name is, Pat Robertson, see on on the crawl on the bottom, see the little old lady sending in their little five or ten dollars. I actually feel sorry for them. Like why y'all yeah. sending him money? And and now I'm beginning to one. I'm beginning to feel the same, and I'm wondering if these college, these suburban college ed- educated white women might even feel some empathy since they're fiscally conservative. For those same little old ladies that have been sending their money to um, uh, Donald Trump to finance something that he never did anything with and couldn't do anything with. Just just the grift, the grift. The, I mean, it seems to me we're going to look at the whole thing. That to me is a is a I mean, I really feel bad about that. I'm, I'm, I mean, because some of those people, they're they're they're. It's like they're brainwashed. Somebody tweeted, Lord have mercy, the other day, reminded everybody about Tom Cruise and Scientology. Everybody running to see Top Gun. And somebody tweeted about that. Now, remember now who this really is. This is the same thing. You are literally grifting people out of money for nothing. And so is this is this even under those circumstances? Can you be considered a legitimate ideological movement? No, you tried. You got a hustle going. You oh have my God. serious hustle going. And I'm just wondering why people, if I, these aren't my people who sending him this money. Yeah. But if I feel like that's just, that hurts me to watch elderly people get taken advantage of that way, it ought to make some of these college educated suburban white women. Is that an acronym yet? C E. <laughs> no, not yet. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's even it. worse than just asking for money and, and grifting them that way. What they do is that they automatically make those monthly donations. So if somebody gives $50 for a fixed income senior, that that's, that's real money that, that, that hurts. It's a real sacrifice. They automatically make it a monthly donation and to turn off the monthly thing, you have to go to a separate screen. So they actually hide the fact. So you, you're having people that gave, you know, oh, $50 and that was a stretch. Suddenly they realized they're giving 50 bucks every month. They can't afford that. Right. And that is the sort of level of grift. The entire Republican Party is doing this, not just not just Donald Trump. They discovered this little trick and they figure it's easier just to refund the money for the ones who notice, because a lot of them don't even notice. A lot of them, it's like their, 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 their son comes in later and takes a look like, why is mom? What? Why doesn't she have money? And they look at, you know, finances and realizes, well, she just lost 600 bucks this year on, on, on his recurring donation that she never intended to make. It's a thing that's actually happening. I'm not making this up. This is, you know, this is the thing that's actually happening. Um, that's, I mean, you're right. This is the, the grift piece in that second, in that second um, c- committee hearing, January 6th committee hearing, really punched through. It actually, and he only spent a little bit of time. So most of the second committee hearing was focused on establishing what Donald Trump knew. Because there's going to be an argument of fraud. Intent is a big part of any criminal proceeding, intent, right? And it's really hard to prove intent because you're basically arguing you knew what the guy was thinking. And that's a really hard thing to prove because, you know, obviously we have no way to drill into somebody's brain. But they spent the entire hearing saying every his campaign manager, 
Um, Miller, who's one of the most disgusting human beings in the world, was telling Donald Trump, uh, Jason Miller, that he lost. Um, Fox News told him that he lost. They had a fo- the Fox News guy who made the call in Arizona. To, so he told him. Um, Ivanka Trump testified that she told him that they had lost. Um, I mean, they went through uh, B- Bill Barr multiple times, told him that he lost his successor. Right. So you're like, OK, you know, we're establishing this is like maybe vaguely interesting. But but what were they doing? They're, they're trying to establish intent. So that's a piece. Yeah. But then at the very end, they, they threw in this whole fraud piece. And man, that thing really punched through. And so you're right. If if suburban, these suburban fiscally conservative suburban white women are like, you know, this this whole this whole party and Donald Trump are just a bunch of grifters. That's actually powerful. Now, Democrats need to drill that home, obviously. Right. Because otherwise they'll forget the next time gas goes up another two cents, you know. Um, all of this is forgotten. So it has to be that constant drumbeat. So, yeah, the Republicans are grifters. Um, they're taking away your right to choose to make your medical decisions with your doctor. They are, you know, they want your children dead. Uh, for all the talk about saving babies, they really don't care about the fact that people are shooting up school. Like, these are all arguments that can be made that, that build, that really sort of motivate our base that not just... Uh, don't alienate those college educated suburban white men, but may actually win them on those issues. And those are the things that may overcome the inflation argument because fundamentally, uh, given the stats, I know some people are, are, are on fixed incomes and inflation hurts and all that, right? But by the statistics, people's salaries have gone up to more than meet the inflation uh, challenge. So their finances aren't actually, in reality, again, broadly speaking, aren't worse off because of inflation. Now, again, you're not going to make that argument, but can you make other arguments that overcome this because they're actually not financially hurting? Yeah, yeah, good point. Before we go, um, latest on Ukraine from your perspective, we talked about weapons last week. Yeah, on on, uh, on uh... Wednesday night, the the United States and the Allies announced another tranche of, of weapons. So that's still coming in. You see a lot of people complaining, oh, it's it. That's not enough. They're... We're talking about like every one to two weeks, there's a new, you know, this is all ongoing. This is like one to two weeks. We're talking a billion dollars. And and what people don't realize, they, they looked at the current, um, the, the, the current tranche of, of weapons and it's, uh, I think off the top of my head, it's like 16 new howitzers and a lot of ammunition, a lot of parts, a lot of night vision goggles. And people think, oh, well, Ukraine asked for a thousand howitzers. The United States entire military does not have a thousand howitzers. So there's a disconnect between what they're asking for, which is like everything. France has 68 artillery guns. Germany has something like 150 there's not that many howitzers to give. Right. So there, there's, a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as, as, listen, I'm just curious. So they think there are a lot, I would assume there are too. Why not? Is, is that an obsolete weapon or? No, not at all. Um, first of all, Republic, uh, Republican, Soviet, Russian, same thing. <laughs> Russian doctrine is just to use artillery to level ground and then have infantry march into the rubble. That's not Western. Um, that's not Western. Um, our artillery, shoots farther, it's more accurate. And so you don't need as many guns. And Western nations are heavily dependent on their air power. So NATO is really an air power, not a ground power, so to speak. And uh, it's for lots of reasons that we, we could always get into maybe in a different show, but we can't just hand over F-16s and, and NATO aircraft to, to, to Ukraine because it'll take about two, three years to train them up under the best of circumstances. This is not the kind of thing you just hand over. But what people don't realize, you see a billion dollars and a lot of it is just parts. People don't realize to move a, a, an American combat brigade. So a combat brigade is going to have um, 60 tanks, 40 infantry vehicles, about 100 armored vehicles and the supporting stuff, right? To move an American combat brigade costs $65,000 per mile. 
$65,000 per mile. That's fuel. That's equipment breaking down. That's, uh, that's um, just wear and tear. It's ammunition and so on. No, not even ammunition. That's just to move. So military equipment just breaks down a lot. And so everybody's, they want MLRS, which is rocket artillery. That was my job. We had nine launchers in our unit. We never had more than six up at any given time. They were always breaking down. And these, at the time, they're like three, four years old. That was 30 years ago. So just imagine the state that they must be in today. This stuff is complicated. It's expensive. It's hard to maintain. It needs a long logistical tail of support. And so you can't just say, all right, here you go. Here's 50 MLRS rocket artillery systems. Then you got to support it, right? You got you to give ammunition. Each six rocket pot of ammunition for MLRS, for rocket artillery, weighs two and a half tons. So imagine what it takes to move that. Uh, you can't move it by air. It's just not efficient enough. So you're going to have to move it by boat. So it's going to take a while. There's some stock in, in Europe, but then you got you to load it on trains. You got to get it to the Ukrainian border. Uh, then you got to transfer it from the Ukrainian border via truck and you got to load it. You got to move it to the front. And that two and a half ton, six pod rocket artillery, it's one fire mission. Boom. Now you got to move the next two and a half ton, right? This is tough. It's so tough, in fact, that, that the, the, uh, the first artillery system that Ukraine got is the M777 howitzer. It's a very relatively simple piece of equipment. And yet Ukraine is having so much trouble maintaining it that they have to ship them from the front lines back to Poland for maintenance. Now you can imagine how inefficient that is. It's because they don't have the experience to, of people training to maintain them, to, to do repairs, to do just basic upkeep. And so um, a training for a uh, artillery maintenance guy is four to five months. Then you go to your unit. That's just initial. That's just, that's just training to teach you this exists. Then you get to your unit and there are, there are NCOs or sergeants who've been doing this job for over a decade to continue that education. Ukraine doesn't have that. It doesn't exist. So yeah, you send these three weeks, you give them a crash course, three weeks to, to learn how to do basic stuff. It's just not enough. And so people really don't understand how difficult it is to, to field a new weapon system, even more so in the middle of a war, to maintain it, to, to fuel it, to supply the ammunition. This is hard stuff. So all the complaining about, oh, it's not enough and they should have done more and why are they not sending more? First of all, you don't have as many artillery guns. They're not, Ukraine's not going to get a thousand howitzers. Just not going to get a thousand howitzers, period. They don't exist. Unless the U.S. emptied out its entire military. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. That was China making noises on Taiwan and, and, uh, and Russia threatening NATO. It's not going to happen. And, uh, and beyond that, it just takes a long time to learn how to not operate them, to maintain them. So yeah. that's the challenge. On the plus side, Russia's pretty stuck in the main Donbass front. They're not moving. They're, I mean, they're moving like, and I'm not even exaggerating, they're moving meters per day, right? They're crawling, taking heavy casualties to pick up 20 meters here, 50 meters there. Uh, but, Ukraine, I, you said for us or for everyone, $65,000 to move a mile. A brigade, is, yeah. An so American that, combat brigade. For them, though, is it what's causing them to move those meters, those many meters? Uh, you know? Russia? Yeah. I mean, Russia is just in the face of, of uh, Ukrainian resistance. So, um, so, and this is like right at the edge of Russian controlled territory from pre war. So, they don't have the log logistical problems yet. Anytime they get any sort of push out from, from their main sort of logistical hubs, they get stuck. They just, they can't. Uh, and we saw this from day one in the war. Anytime their, their lines, roughly about 25 kilometers, so about 15 miles is the most they can move without running into major logistical problems. So, so, so I guess what I'm asking is in terms of that numerical cost, that money cost, they, what would cost us 65,000 probably cost them even more. Um, 
Yeah, that that I I I wouldn't know. I mean, I'm sure they pay their people less, so the the manpower cost is less, and okay, uh, and um, so um, that, but it, it's I mean they're they're paying in, in lives. I mean that's this is the yeah. thing in, in material and lives. So it's costing them a lot more because their their stuff is just getting blown up, and most of Ukraine is flat and open. And so that means that anybody that's on the attack is open to an artillery barrage. And so, you know, it makes it hard for Russia to move, but it also makes it hard for Ukraine to get its territory back. And, and right now there's a major offensive in the South, a major counteroffensive. Ukraine is attacking and retaking territory in Southern uh, Ukraine in route to Kherson, which is the most important Ukrainian city in, under Russian occupation. And uh, it's it seems to be gaining steam and, and um, that might be exciting. But anytime they overextend Ukraine, they, you know, or if they master forces in the area, artillery takes them out. And so this is the this is the challenge. This is why Ukraine wants a thousand artillery guns. Right. They they want to be able to to fight in the entire front, which is about a thousand miles. They want to be able to fight that entire front and have all the artillery. And like I said, Western artillery has longer range than Russian artillery. So they can sit out of range of that Russian artillery and take out those uh, Russian artillery guns. That, I, I think I said that right. Um, and uh, so they want more and it's, it's natural, right? You, you Go ahead, ask for more. It just doesn't exist. <laughs> so you gotta at least be realistic about what the request is. And, uh, and they don't need as much. It's just given that our stuff is more accurate, has longer range. And this is also important. Ukraine isn't wasting artillery on destroying uh, civilian infrastructure. So a lot of a lot of Russian guns. What they're doing is they're laying waste to entire towns. That takes a lot of a lot of guns. You know, if you want to take out a city block, you're going to use a lot more ordnance than if you're taking out one tank or one infantry position. And there's a lot of uh, Russian shelling of non-militarily important. Uh, infrastructure in, in certain towns that are outside the front lines out of rage. Like, there's no military reason for them to be bombing uh, civilian apartment buildings in towns like Kharkiv and Mykolaiv, which are not on the front lines, but they do it anyway, just because they're angry. It's, it's rage murdering. Um, and again, um, that waste ordinance just callously speaking, that's ordinance that's not being lobbed at Ukrainian military targets. Folks, get all the latest. Look, the when it comes to Ukraine and the January 6th, the cable networks can only give you sound bites because that's a limited amount of time. But if you log on to dailycoast.com, you will get a smorgasbord of coverage. Brandy Bugman on January 6th, Mark Sumner on Ukraine. Really, this is some really... Good. And me on Ukraine. <laughs> I've been writing up a storm. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and Marcos is a veteran. So he knows that's why he knows how much it costs to move a mile. Oh, Most man. It's, it's brutal. He, yeah. That's what he did. And he did the logistics. He did all that. So, so we get a sense of that. So, folks, uh, that's some great journalism right there at your fingertips. Do follow. And if you, if you watch that, you'll be more informed when you watch the sound bites. Uh, you can fill in all the blanks. Daily Coast, Thursday Coast. The Brief, the podcast, civicswithaq.com. Thank you, buddy. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye. Talk to you next week. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister or brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.